but welcome back inside brunch uh, we are talking this morning we started with Eden Garden and then we graduated into the area um, we graduated into the area of uh, CL uh, Financials, uh, which is what we're discussing right now, the whole question of the government moving to liquidate the assets to recover money. I asked Peter Permel, who is the chairman of the Clico Policyholders Group, to join us this morning because I wanted us to lay a foundation, lay the path of all of this that led to. A lot of folks pick up the story where the government moved in, and, 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 and while you hear headlines all over the place, the actual context, the actual influence, the actual participation, the actual commanding heights of the economy that Clico was a part of is not clear to everybody. And then, of course, what went wrong there. So let me start by welcoming uh, Peter Purnell. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Rennie, and uh, good morning to all your listeners out there, and p- particularly the policy holders. You know, they're yes. locked on and, and listening. Immaculately dressed as always. Always. Well, you know, when I'm coming in this, this August chamber, I need to be Mer- completely dressed. Then we are flattered indeed. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. I want you to start from the beginning. Uh, yes, there's no other place to start. Uh, because I want to dissect and detail the Clico CLF empire for our listeners this morning. I, I want you to, when I say dissect, because there are many parts of it, I want to make that clear. And then detail uh, CLF, because I want to go into the area of why it failed. So lay the foundation for us, sure. please. Sure. Well, the topic this morning is CL Financial, which is the conglomerate. It's really a holding company where you have a number of subsidiary companies and associate companies. What I mean by that is a subsidiary company is a company where the, the parent company owns more than 51% of the shareholding and an associate is where they own less than 51%. So they are, they are, they are, they are permutation combinations of those types of companies that the, the conglomerate own owns and those uh, companies they they, they they not only um, domiciled in Trinidad and Tobago but they throw out the Caribbean and some are even globally in the US and in Europe and so on you had companies like Thomas Hine you had companies like Burns Stewart Lacerda del Mercado you have um, home, Con- home construction limited the second largest land bank in Trinidad and Tobago after the government and they own the the malls that you all go to every day, and um, uh, you know the Long Circular Mall, just just a, f- a few minutes away from here. You have Strin City Mall. Uh, you had Val Park Shopping Plaza that was disposed of, and that's another story by itself. Atlantic Plaza. I mean, the list goes. I could spend the rest of the morning just outlining the number of assets that CL Financial had, uh, and most importantly, Republic Bank. They owned um, about fifty-two or 53% of the Republic Bank shares. So you can well imagine the, 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 the magnitude of this and size of this, this conglomerate. As a matter of fact, in its heyday, uh, I think in 2007-2008, it had as- assets of over $100 billion. So it was really the, the largest um, and most um, largest by asset um, entity in the, in the Caribbean. I think they were, mm-hmm. they, obviously they were larger than Ansel McCall and the Ansel McCall Group. So we're talking here about a significant player in the economy of not only Trinidad and Tobago, but I would I would dare say the region. And that's why when the crash came in, or the collapse, whichever way you want to look at it, in 2009, the government had no choice but to intervene. It brings us back to the old saying, the too big to fail. That was the buzzword at the time, as you know, even in the U.S. J.P. Morgan situation. J.P. Morgan, Burns, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, to be a Stearns, um, Bank of America, City, AIG, the largest mm-hmm. insurance company in the world, all of them found themselves in difficulties. They were bail, they were bail, bail out in the U.S. As a matter of fact, what's interesting about that, um, Reddy, and you, you, I'm sure you're familiar with that U.S. situation, the, 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 the U.S. government injected substantial funds into that into, into those entities, and they have, in fact, paid back all the money <laughs> as we speak. But it's cognizance of mm. that why we are where we are, because so. you will remember it. when these banks paid back yes. and the government actually did their final declaration, they said it was not just billions of dollars we put in, but trillions of dollars because you look at all the other things sure. that's affected by it. That's going to be part of our discussion this morning, Absolutely. because when we get to the part of what the government assess as what is owed them, yes. there are some other areas we have to talk about. Uh, so, so essentially even though you got tired of it, I didn't want you to be tired of it, and I'm okay. glad that you detailed it, because for listeners to get a full appreciation as to exactly how big yes. this was. Okay, you said 
if I recall back in 2012, that the reason this failed is because of a purchase of 6,000 acres of land in in Florida. Yeah, OCO All right. County, yeah. uh, back in 20, uh, two, 2008. Now, this was a whole lot of money. It was uh, $295 million. Was US, the purchase. Huh? US, US uh, was the purchase. You said that is the reason that failed. Well, that's one of the reasons. I think the, the media may have misquoted me in terms of that can't be the only reason, but obviously that would be a, a significant player in terms of one of the reasons why why the why the conglomerate uh, sorry conglomerate slash clico w- would have failed and uh, that issue was you know was um in looked at at the commission of inquiry the sir anthony coleman commission of inquiry and unfortunately we yet to hear the results of that report and the reason i raised the, yes. the, the point uh peter permel yes. is supposed to be hearing not just because of the 295 million dollar purchase because people make decisions sometimes and it's just a not very not not a very good decision but you call it the most egregious example of mismanagement Absolutely. And, and my comments were based on documentation that I would have obtained from the, the, the courts in Miami because this matter, as a matter of fact, went to, to the Miami courts. And uh, I'm not too sure what the latest position, if it was it has been resolved there, but certainly there were all sorts of allegations being made against people who were close uh, in the senior management of, and this was in particular, this was Baiko, British American. This mm-hmm. was not so much the Clico side. But this was the British American side of it. There was a gentleman, um, his name uh, escapes me now, but he was at the center of the whole transaction. Um, Afro will surely remind me of that name. Branca, yes, that's the guy's name, Branca. Uh, he was at the center. He was, I think, was the, 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 the head man at, at, at British American. Mm-hmm. And um, when you go into the details of how that transaction would do, was done, there's no way that Baiko should have even entered into that transaction because the assets of Baiko were far less than the size of that. Can you imagine it's like a, a ant trying to, 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 to fight with an elephant or to consume an elephant? You see, so that no, that sounds like uh, l- l- like uh, the true not public trying to get their money back. Anyway, I'm sorry, but do continue. <laughs> I digress. <laughs> so, so, so they had serious issues with that, and that's one transaction. But that was a huge transaction. As I said, unfortunately, we still don't know what the, what's Anthony Coleman Coleman's opinion is uh, vis-a-vis that transaction, because as you know, that report went to the president initially, and then he passed it to the prime minister. And we understand that the prime minister, based on reports coming out of the parliament, that he passed it to the director of public prosecutions. And he said that he can, he, he's, he can't, he can't, they can't make any further statements or disclosures with respect to that report because it could prejudice any future um, prosecution that could arise out of that. Then let me just ask you, the, you called it the most egregious example of mismanagement. Have you, with the information coming uh, subsequent to that statement, have you had reason to, to, to pull back on that? Or do you still stand by that for that particular time? No, I stand by that, by that, by that statement. Why were there insufficient checks and balances and safeguards put in place in order to avoid this situation? Because this is a case of a decision made Afra, I know that you have to go. Forgive me a second, Peter. Uh, Afra, you, you still have time for me, and I know you have to run. You've got five minutes. All right, I'll get back to you in just a minute. Because, And the reason I ask that is because when you try to second guess sometimes decisions made by uh, management, it's a little difficult. Hindsight is always twenty twenty, so you know. But but, but if, if you had checks and balances in place, then something like that should not have been allowed to continue to the extent it did, should it? You see the problem, Rennie, you can't have checks and balances for integrity and honesty. Uh, those things is either you have it or you don't. Uh, and you can't, li- that, that's another thing, you can't li- litigate or, 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 or put, put legis- or legislate, I should say, legislate for integrity and honesty. And therefore, no amount of checks and balances you have if somebody's intent on doing something mm. that is dishonest, they're going to do it. You, you know what I mean? Hopefully, the checks and balances will pick it up either before or after. But there's absolutely nothing you can do if somebody wants to do something that is dishonest. Mm-hmm. You see, because an, an, an AFRA has to go, so let me just get sure. my, my input from AFRA on, the, on this here. Uh, and, and the reason I am pursuing this angle of it is because I want to respect the right of companies to make decisions. I do, however, feel, and that's why I started the way I did, if a company has such an influence in the, in, in, in the economy of a country, mm-hmm. then there are some things that should be put in place that monitors 
monitors what goes on there because if this mistake by management is made, the, the domino effect is going to affect everybody as it did. And that's the reason I asked the question. You concur um, um, in, in conclusion as you're about to leave. Um, Afro, do you agree uh, with, with, with Peter here that we're talking about this purchase was a major contributor to, to, to what happened there? I think it was a big factor. The, the biggest factor in my view was the sort of underlying method of raising funds, which was to raise funds by those EFPA, the short-term instruments. They were very high interest and effectively taking those funds, harvesting the funds through through agencies like CIB with the investment note certificate, Clico and um, British American. You harvested funds by a high, in, high interest instrument and then invested them in long-term Project. So that was that piece of financial architecture was was a piece of architecture that was difficult. Mm. The, the actual transaction I feel that was the worst bunch was the one with LaSalle's Mercado that was completed in 2008 and consumed close to 600 million US dollars to buy that rum company in Jamaica. Now that was, if you ask me to vote, I, yeah. I think the, the one in Florida was pretty mm. bad. Mm. The other thing I want to say in, in support of the point that mm. colleagues are making here is that in fact it reminds me of a saying a friend of mine had that you can't make a good mm. deal with a bad man. So in fact, somebody who is intent, who, who is fundamentally tricky, you, it doesn't matter how many lawyers write it or what mm. you sign and you seal and you register, they will not honor the agreement. And therefore, we, we, this is what we are grappling with in this, in this sort of scenario here. We've been, we've been called to notions of honor and decency and I think the word is spiteful and we've been called to those <laughs> notions. And, and the question is, how could, we, how could we really be negotiating in those terms? The other thing I want to say in closing, because I've, I've already got to go on, Peter, over to you. The other thing I want to say in closing is that I want to just deal quickly with that question of how we related, you related the, bail, the Trinidad and Tobago bailout to the sort of Wall Street scenario. And I want to say that the big difference in my mind between the two scenarios is that in Wall Street, the companies that received the bailout from the United States federal agencies paid interest. So in the case of AIG, mm. which was the biggest insurance company in the world at the time, the, mm. the base rate in America was 3.5%. The interest rate for the money that rescued AIG was 11.5%. They mm. paid 3.8 times the base rate. You see, you all, never, that, mm -hmm. all that Dupree has paid is, is on the first $5 billion, he paid 4.75%. If you spread that 4.75% over the sort of 25 or whatever the figure is, it's less mm -hmm. than 1%. So therefore, we're talking about, if we're, if we're speaking as people who have financial minds or financial understanding, we have to speak to the time value of money and the cost of money and the question of interest. We can't be oblivious to interest and we need to accept and acknowledge the fact that the bailout in Trinidad and Tobago was like the bailout nowhere else on the planet. This is the only time that a tycoon, the wealthiest mm. man in the Caribbean, got hold of our funds to pay his debts on terms that, in fact, the ordinary taxpayer can't get. If, if this radio station was owing the mm. government $100,000 in taxes, the penalty rate of interest is 20% a year. You see, so I never want to say that is the difference. And if we're speaking as financial people, and we're trying to bring financial understanding to bring some understanding to the thing for the public, if we're trying to bring some financial understanding, let us understand everything is not everything. It is not the same as Wall Street. One of the things you don't do is to give your final word to a guest who's looking at your notes. Because I'm going there. That whole question of the $23 million, I am going there. Because that, that question, no, that, <laughs> you know what I mean. You didn't actually see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You just, we, we're in the same lane. Because right, right. that question of interest is going to be a serious uh, conversation I'm going to have with Peter. Afra, thank you so much for taking the yes. time to drop in this morning, my friend. All right, Afra Raymond, uh, who is a chartered uh, surveyor and managing director of Raymond and Pair Limited, thank you so much for being with us. Let us go back to my guest now, Peter Purnell, who is the chairman of the Clico Policy Holders Group, and we are talking about what went wrong with the CLF Financial. I, let, let me ask you this question. As, as, as chairman of the Policy um, Holders Group, it, would the policyholders accept that everything would have been lost, save for the TNT government intervention? Is, is, is that accepted? Absolutely. But, uh, but, the, but the country also has to accept that everything would also have been lost in terms of the, the financial system had the bailout not taken place. So this, uh, and, as, and, and, and Terence Farrell said it best, Dr. Terence Farrell, let me give him his, 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 um, his kudos. Um, the, a bailout is never about saving policyholders or depositors. It is about saving the economy. And the policyholders 
benefit as a result of that. It is, they are never the center <laughs> or the reason why the bailout takes place. Because what you're really looking at is the bigger picture. And as I said, it, it was a situation of too big to fail. Mm -hmm. Had CL Financial slash Clico failed, you would have had a crash. The financial system of Trinidad and Tobago would have crashed. So people like who, are, who, who had no policies in Clico, who probably never shopped in a, in a, in a, in a business owned by Clico, mm -hmm. would have been impacted. So you, as a matter of fact, the, within days or within a day of that announcement being made, I think it was on the 30th of January, you had a long line in front of Republic Bank, when in fact Republic Bank was a well-run, solid organization. But you may have thought that CL Financial owned 52% of Republic Bank shares, people thought that they would have a contagion effect, which is what the central bank governor, Mr. Ewood Williams, said. You would have had contagion effect so that even though there was not real risk, there would have been a perceived risk, and people would have acted on that perception. You see, it is cognizant yeah. of, of that yes. why I am asking the question, yes. because if we are looking now mm -hmm. at what could have been, as you said, stepped in there and you saved the entire country, quite frankly, and in many will argue uh, that we shan't go to, to, to that part. If if you allow now a situation where folks are saying, give us back the company mm -hmm. and we will pay you what is owed over a period of time. First of all, let me ask you, we're hearing over and over that the money is in hand to repay the government and people of Trinidad and Tobago. Is that report accurate? I think it is, and I'll tell you why. There's a document, uh, which I only got, re um, well, we had our press conference with the shareholders, and, and we only really concretized an, an, an alliance with them the day before. That's when the news broke that the government was supposedly going to liquidate Clico and CL Financial. Mm -hmm. And that document was commissioned by CL Financial, the, par the, um, the parent company, the same company we're talking about mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. uh, in consultation with the shareholders. And that document called Project Rebirth, and and I, I'll give, I'll probably show you. I can't give you. I'll show you what it looks like. It's a very detailed document, and it speaks to how the assets of Clico can be disposed of in an orderly and timely mm -hmm. fashion to ensure that not only the, the, the taxpayers get back their money, but the policyholders who the government has slammed the door in, in our faces can get back our money, and any of the other creditors that, that, that CL Financial and slash Clico owns. No matter where we go, there are variables in everything we do. There is no foolproof, absolute guarantee of something happening. And, they, and, the, and the taxpayer will ask the question, and, sorry. you were asking me for you to take back, you, the, uh, the, the, the shareholders, take back control, which mm -hmm. may even be by law, you're allowed to do that. Let's just give, give that. Sure. Uh, but you're asking me now to hold faith with an organization that put me here in the first place. And then their variables are among the best plan made. Are you telling me to hold on for my money? Because I, I, I would think if the money is there, you can say, we give you back your money now. But you're and saying the money is, is there, but not there because we have a plan that the money can come to you. And, and, and as I said, I'm not speaking on behalf of the shareholders, but I'm speaking as somebody who understands finance and who's seen that, that project reboot uh, plan. And we're talking about a plan that was um, uh, put together by one of the best auditing firms, auditing slash accounting firms in Trinidad, Bay, Pricewaterhouse Coopers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're an international player. They're one of the big four in the world. And therefore, um, the question you, you, you pose is very, very much pertinent in the sense that the alternative, well, sorry, before I get to that, the plan really proposes for the, for the government to be paid within 120 days. So I don't know if that is a pretty long time relative to the eight years that we have taken to get here. So 120 days is the plan that would pay back the government a substantial, I think it was about 13 point something billion dollars. And the other 2 billion, because as you know, the claim that is being made by the government is some 15 billion. That's what they have gone to court to, to wind up or liquidate CL Financial for. Because they have received 7, seven they've billion. Already, they've already received 7, 7 billion, billion of 23 uh, well, billion. Well, that, that is a, that's another story because the government doesn't seem to know how much it is owed. That, that seems to be a moving target. Because there are some variables, i.e. legal fees and so on, and that question which, of interest. Which, is that which part of the conversation? Which raises other questions as to how those, le those fees arise, which I think I, I don't know if I raise it on your program, but I certainly raise it elsewhere in the public domain. You raised it the last time you were because here. Because yes. $3.2 billion of legal fees, there's no way. And I, I, was, I was trying to wrap my brain about how they arrived at that. So therefore, there's some other things inside of there that the government needs to tell us about. But let's we digress. Let's go back to the point that you raised. The alternative to the Project Rebirth proposal is the liquidation of what the government is proposing of CL Financial. Mm -hmm. Now, Rennie, let me tell you as it is. 
as I said in the, in the, in the I'm sure you read my article, the, 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 my comments in the media. That is a fire, fire sale. sale. Mm-hmm. Liquidation equates fire sale. Mm-hmm. Fire sale, mm-hmm. you're talking knockdown prices. You're talking the people who are going to benefit from that are certainly not going to be taxpayers because once you have a liquidation, you're going to have cents on the dollar. There's no way you're going to get $100, 100 cents out of the dollar. You're talking maybe, I think I looked at a document that was done by um, PKF, and they were looking at about 31 cents on the dollar in a liquidation. That was a, a 2013 report. The point is that a liqu- you know, but the liquidation was always an option. That was always on the table. That's known as the nuclear option. So you don't press that button unless it is absolutely necessary. But uh, are they not pressing it because of the fear that if their appointed directors are not there, if their appointed directors are not there, the company could take a direction that they may find not right. And on the question of the pennies on the dollar, which you're quite right about, you are the, the financial expert, and, 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 and all the evidence are, are with you here. Even if you have $40 billion estimated the worth of the company and the government is seeking 15. One thing for sure, even pennies on the dollar, they'll get this. No, 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 no. That, that 40 billion is on the basis of a going concern principle, mm. not on the basis of a liquidation. As I told you, liquidation is fire sale. What was selling for $10, now selling for 5 Because it, it, you, as, when somebody hears a liquidation, as far as they're concerned, that's damaged goods. I'm not paying you fair, mark, fair value. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm giving you a discounted price. So you're not in a position to negotiate any a good price for you. For you. you have to sell it at whatever somebody's willing to pay you. But more than that, apart from the fact that you're going to get 21 cents, t- t- roughly 31 cents on the dollar, is the length of time that that, that, that liquidation will take. We, we've spent eight years dealing with this issue. What are we going to do? Spend another eight years, uh, Renny. CIB is a classic example. CIB was um, was um, uh, they pulled the, pulled the license of CIB Clico Investment Bank in 2009, and they went to court. Uh, Mr. the Inspector of Financial Institution, Mr. Carl Hiralal, and he got a winding up order for, for that was an easy one for CIB because that was so insolvent to the max. And do you know that 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 liquidation is still ongoing as we speak? We still don't even know how much money they have actually recovered. And in a liquidation, you need to liquidate all the assets before you start paying out any money to anybody in terms of the cents on the dollar that I'm just speaking about. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about you. The, the government is want to put this country through another eight years of this of this mess. And not only that. In the meantime, the, 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 the proceeds from the sale of assets were supposed to balance the budget. As you know, there's a big hole in the budget as we speak. And the government is, inst- the alternative to getting the money from the sale of these assets is to now call on the Heritage and Stabilization Fund and borrow more money. Well, the Stabilization Fund, you will agree, was there for that fund reason. But I, I, I want to stay but with where you are. There. What, what I'm trying to get hold of is the, the, what is the current value of CLF? But what well, is the estimated value? Well, that forty billion is what what is what is is, is mooted there. And what is owed to the but, government is fifteen billion. Yeah, but 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 what I'm saying is, I I, I didn't come prepared to get into the specifics of, of of that because those are details, and I and I don't want to, I don't want to speak to that here. But what I'm dealing with is the principal Rennie. You're talking a negotiated settlement of which this, the shareholders of CL Financial are very much prepared to sit down with the government and negotiate, as opposed to a forced sale, which is a liquidation that will give you cents on the dollar, that will take another eight years to resolve. And will, and you know who's going to be the beneficiaries, ready? The lawyers. They made a ton. If you thought they made money during the Commission of Inquiry, they're going to make about three times that in this liquidation. You're going to have the liquidator. Right now, the liquidator for CIB gets in excess of $100,000 a month. We're not talking the other staff that goes with, with, with the liquidation. So that, so that the, the beneficial, and I, 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 I need not mention, the people who are going to be salivating of the thought of these discounted assets are big business. I am not in dispute yes. of that, yes. and, I, and, I, and, and I read where your, your comment mm-hmm. centered on that, and, and there, is no evidence, is, there is no evidence to contradict that. Uh, here, uh, here is what I'm trying uh, to understand. Uh, Peter Permel, my guest, is the chairman of the Clico Policyholders Group. He's sure. giving us clarity I'm seeking to extract uh, even uh, f- for me to, to, to follow part of this. Here is my thing. You said negotiations would be a good thing mm-hmm. as to how we get out of this. Yes. Had there been negotiations on a couple of things? One, the fees to get to some area of that. Two, the lack of interest coming to the country. And even if you ask for eight more years, it's going to be a question of interest. Uh, still has to be raised. 
and the question of the board of directors before we got to this to this point where the shareholders took a decision what led to that decision by the shareholders to remove the government appointed directors as against having negotiations make that clear beautiful for me. question what made what took took them to that point is the level of mismanagement that has been going on in, in C, Clico and CL Financial, and I make no apologies for saying that. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you read the the Guardian this morning, um, Rennie. The headline was, uh, "Government takes Clico's no man's land," and I spoke extensively about that. What you have is a situation where that asset has been carried on the books of Clico at one hundred and eighty-seven million dollars, mm -hmm. and. In accordance with the with the with the the the, 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 the requirements of the central bank under um, Section Forty Four D, they are supposed to transfer for value that asset, not transfer that the carrying value. For value means the fair market value. Mm -hmm. That PwC report puts that asset of, at over eight hundred million dollars, or uh, in terms of what the market would 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 would, 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 would fetch on the market, and. I am asking the question. I'm not accusing the minister of anything, and I hope he's listening or, his, or who, somebody who's listening will go and ask him. What I want to know is what value that asset was transferred for. Because what that, if it was transferred, as I suspect, because there was no, in the notes, there was no gain or loss on the transfer of the asset. Because if, if you transfer it for fair market value, then it would either be higher or lower than the carrying value, and therefore you would either realize a gain or a loss. And that is supposed to be disclosed in the audited financial statements, which we, some, some kind soul, left a copy in our mailbox. So, and the minister to date has not disclosed that, one, the, the asset was sold, and two, at what price it was sold. So the point is, that is robbing the company of about $680 million if, in fact, and I want to, I want to use my words carefully, Mr. if, in mm -hmm. fact, it was transferred at the carrying value. In other words, it, the, the, but what, we don't know what value it was transferred. No, no, that's why I'm asking the question, and I mm. hope you are going mm. to ask the question as a, as a good journalist and if, reporter. If we get the opportunity, uh, yes. we will. So, we'll, so mm -hmm. that, what I'm, but I'm using that as an example to show you, Rennie, that a lot of that has gone on. There's a hotel in, in Miami called the W Hotel. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It was sold to the Dolphins owner, um, I can't remember his name, for a song and a dance, as far as I'm concerned. We don't know how that transaction it never came into the public domain so shouldn't be the claim be then for transparency in the dealings uh of 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 of, of, of cl financial as against us getting to this point where dealings, we are here the dealings of the the authorities who have entered into in cl financial but they've asked for that and that's the point i'm making to you you see you see Renny, i've lived this for the last eight years i make no apologies for saying that i've lived this every day so I know the intricacies of the issue. So what mm -hmm. I'm telling you is that this issue has been shrouded in secrecy and a lack of accountability for the last eight years. And it has straddled successive governments. It's not just the PNM who's engaging in this level, level of obfuscation, secrecy, and lack of accountability. The previous administration probably did a worse job in terms, in terms of that. And if one has to ask oneself, why is that happening? You are, who's guarding the guards? You have come into the organization to wind up this thing in a very orderly and expeditious manner. This should have been wound up at least about three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. But for some strange reason, they keep moving the goalposts, mm -hmm. kicking the can down the road. Decisions that should have been made are not being made. And all this time, they were in control of the board of CL Financial. So one can well understand why the shareholders would be getting restless, they would be getting impatient. Because every day that it, this issue drags on, not only does the, does the, does the, the, the putting the country through trauma, but the, tax pay, the, the, but the shareholders are losing value because you're paying all the, the high price. The, the chair, do you know what the chairman of CL Financial makes? He makes about $250,000 a month. That's his salary. And that is why you have a situation where one fellow who is no one, who has serious allegations are being made about him, is refusing to leave that company and go right off into the sunset. So you have to ask yourself, everybody who's, who has come into the picture mm. is not, now stands to benefit. So it is not in their interest to resolve this matter quickly. The longer this thing drags on, and as I said, this nuclear option that they have, they have pressed is a renewal of that feeding frenzy that has been taking place. PWC, P, uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper, they have a, a, a renewal uh, uh, proposal, is what you're saying. Reboot. Pro Project, Project Reboot. Project Reboot. Yes. All right. And, and, and they, as you said before, uh, for integrity and stuff like that, you cannot legislate that. You can't put any safeguards. They have a, a proposal. The proposal is that you're saying it would, uh, would uh, need 120 days for this to be... According to Project Reboot. According to Project Reboot. According to Project Reboot. 
done by done yes. by <laughs> done by PWC. So they're putting their reputation behind that, not Peter Pavel. But they cannot make the so, company do things, can they? No, 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 no. They can't make the company, but the, mm. but, they are, but the but the but the but the shareholders are not in charge of the company. So that proposal had the government sat down and seriously looked at it. They would still be on the board of of of, of CL Financial. The reason why they have taken this action that is the straw that broke the camel's back. That proposal was submitted since, from what I understand, since December of 2016. We are in July, and the government seems to have not even looked at the proposal. So that, so that, so that one can understand the frustration and the impatience, and therefore they have said enough is enough. So through the director that represents the interests of the uh, of the state uh, yeah. uh, of Trinidad and Tobago taxpayers, uh, the government appointed um, four uh, directors. Director. Four directors. Right through those directors, uh, were you not getting answers? As uh, absolutely not, not at the level of the parent neither at the level of the subsidiary companies. So as I said, Reddy, we really don't know what has been going on inside of there. Mm. Assets are being disposed of, but I don't see, when I look in the newspaper, mm -hmm. I don't see CL Financial, take, I'll give you a classic example. When um, uh, this, uh, um, Val Park Shopping Plaza was sold, did you see that advertised in the newspaper? Were you, if, assuming you were, were in a position to put a bid in, you, 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 uh, you may have put in a bid. But well, you first have to know it's being sold. So you can't, buy, you can't be interested in buying something if you don't know it's being sold. So there are selective purchasers who were approached, clearly, mm. to purchase these mm. assets that the rest of the country doesn't know about and, and, and therefore didn't have an opportunity to participate in. And this is going to even be worse now with a liquidator because the liquidator in law has the authority to, have, to enter into private treaties or public treaties to, to, say, to sell assets. So the country will still not know when these assets are sold, of, sold who they are sold to, and for what, and what price they are sold at until the end of the liquidation, which is about eight, nine years down the road. The action taken by the government to wind up uh, the to liquidate the assets of CL Financial, the position taken by the PwC uh, proposal, the position now um, confronting shareholders. Where are we at this point? What do you anticipate will happen? Well, this is going to the, be the battle royale, as far as I'm concerned, because. The, f first of all, to wind up a company, the first the company has to be insolvent. Although I saw an article in the Express today speaking, about, speaking to the issue of that CL Financial is insolvent, I am not quite sure that that article is 100% is accurate um, based on the information that the PwC looked at. So you have two, two set of professionals, PwC, and I'm not too sure where they got I think it's probably Ernst & Young who probably may be giving that information. If, if it's not Ernst, I, I apologize, Ernst & Young, but but I think I saw Mr. Suping Chow being quoted, and I know he's a senior partner in Ernst & Young, mm -hmm. so I'm not too sure if they're the ones who've come up with that information. But be that as it may, you have PwC on the one hand who looked at the same set of information and is saying that there's a doable plan that can repay the government $13 plus billion dollars in, 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 in 120 days, and the rest we can work that out, you know, in, in another, in a short, in a subsequently. And there you have another, another group of professionals saying, hey, these, these people are insolvent um, to the tune of whatever figure they came up with there. What is going to happen, Renny? This is going to play out in the courts. And, 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 and maybe it's a good thing because all the information that we as the policyholders have been asking for it over the years mm -hmm. will now have to come out. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a hearing tomorrow morning and I've, I'm, I'm considering going down there myself to, to hear what they have to say because the actual, um, that matter is going to come up on the 25th where the, the petition the government has filed a petition mm -hmm. and it's going to come up for, for, for review by the courts. And the, but it did it, th uh, sorry, ex parte. So CL Financial was not there and they are going to now be there on the 25th to argue their case as to why CL Financial should not be wound up. And interestingly, there's an opinion that CL Financial got since 2013, which outlines the reasons why CL Financial can't be wound up at this time. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is that the government is not a direct creditor of CL Financial. I don't know if you knew that, Renny, or the country knows that. Mm. The, that the, the government never lent CL Financial any money directly. The government lent money to Clico, which is a subsidiary, $5 billion, and to CIB, which is another subsidiary, $2 mm. billion. And the money that it paid to the policyholders in terms of, of the offer were really IOUs, the pieces of paper. There was no real cash. 
But that that as the as those are used matured, then you were able to get cash, and that was like about five hundred million dollars each year for the next twenty years. So we have to really figure out what we're talking about here. And I'm glad, as I said, that this matter is going to now be in the courts, and everybody who was hiding uh, under the cloak of, uh, but I can't disclose this, and I can't tell you that, and this. They know have to come clean. Mm. And as I said, I have no horse in this race. All, the only horse I have in this race is to make sure policy that the policyholders mm -hmm. get back what is contractually due to them. And if it if it is that the, the shareholders are saying, we agree with you. That's what is happening here already. The shareholders are saying, we agree with you guys. There's enough money in there to pay back the government and to pay you all the difference that is owed to you. If they are saying that, on the other hand, the government, who's supposed to be have our back, is now telling us, we don't give a hooty on the blowfish about you guys. We slamming the door in your face. You have another cent to get. And the basis they're giving it, they're saying is that you sold your rights, so you have nothing. And we haven't the previous government entered into a radio with the click not to play all your money. So that does not doesn't make any sense. And we are not accepting that. And we are going to we are going to be in monitor the situation very closely and ensure that justice is done in the end. Whichever way the, 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 the chips fall, let it fall where it may. It's going to be interesting. Uh, Peter uh, Permel, uh, chairman of the Clico Policyholders Group. Uh, of course, policyholders, I would love to see them uh, get what is due. Um, but this is, this is a titanic battle you're talking about. And uh, we, will, we will wait and we shall see a clash of the titans and see how this works out. Peter, thank you so much for taking the you're time. You're most welcome. This morning. Anytime. All right. Uh, your policyholders, um, they are going to be sitting on pins and needles watching this equally. So I'll be inviting you back here at another time. I'll be happy to come back again. Thank you so much, Peter. Yeah. <laughs>